All right. We talked about we're gonna, this is going to be the second in this series that's going to follow up with kind of the basic equations of mathematics of this structure stuff, if you would. And I want to point out we've already looked at the fact that 1 over the radius of curvature equals the moment, internal moment, divided by the moment of inertia. I'm sorry, um, divided by the modulus of elasticity times the second moment of the area or the moment of inertia. And we talked about that this combined with boundary conditions really leads to the loads and kind of things that go inside of the boundary conditions leads to what's going on in time, any point in the structure. And so I guess you have your best example of this, most straightforward would be, would be a cantilever here that is subject to, it has a span of L, right, we'll call that span L, and then it's subject to a load P out on the end with that P being across the face there. And you can finally calculate that in fact the moment right here is going to be equal to P times L and that decreases as you go across the face there. All right, so this is actually what the moment diagram looks like. And so you're going to realize later that you know already, like I've talked about before, that you can kind of guess that the shape of this shape of that looks something like that. All right, now we can also have, this would be considered a beam. We also have the condition of a, potentially of a column, right, or a, a load that's loaded, a, a, a member that's load, loaded concentrically down the, the down the axis here and you can see here that that's going to tend to kind of buckle based on Euler's formula. So the fact here of a couple other concepts of what we've talked about before I probably forgot in the other previous video is that this formula here which is the bending stress equals MC over I is also M over S which is the moment divided by the section modulus. So let's get all at all the derived things that come from this concept of the moment of inertia. So the first one is we know that I over C is equal to S. Okay, so that one we know, I over C, which would give S units of inches to the third. We also are going to learn something called the radius of gyration. So the radius of gyration and here's another Grant's tomb question what are the units of the radius of gyration you guessed it inches or distance and the radius of gyration is equal to the square root of the moment of inertia or the second moment of the area divided by the area inches of the fourth divided by inches squared square rooted and you get a radius of gyration that radius gyration is going to kind of be one other number that essentially tells you how resistant this thing is to essentially to buckling because we use this typically when we're talking about how stress is set up in a column so I'm going to go shoot through here and talk about radius of gyration in different directions when we start talking about not necessarily uh, your standard regular old 2 by 4 so I'm going to go now and go to a new sheet and I'm here so we're talking about here now review start inking by the way this works a lot nicer in PowerPoint than in smooth board but it's probably something I haven't hit yet correct alright so here's what we know 1 over rho equals M over E I we know that S equals I over C which means that and we know that the radius of gyration radius of gyration is equal to the square root of I over A these are very often looked in a book. Now let's look at what that means for a beam. For a beam, you remember we know if we make this beam, it's going to have a depth of D, a half depth of C, and a width of B, typically on a beam. We know that I equals B H cubed over 12. We know that C equals H over 2. Right. So there's a whole bunch you can do within here. And we know that the radius of gyration is going to be, in this case, B H cubed over 12 divided by B H, and we're going to take the whole square root of it, aren't we? In other words, the radius of gyration is equal to the moment of inertia divided by the area. The area here is base times height, and I should have called that D or very often it's going to be H, B H cubed when you look at this. The B's cancel. 1h cancels, you get h squared over 12 square root is the radius of gyration. If you look at this the other way, however, 
right? It's going to change. So it's going to have a different radius of gyration with respect to that axis, or in other words, that line of symmetry and this line of symmetry. So you're going to have two radius of gyration, and in the end, you can use the radius of, di radius of gyration about the x-axis and about the y-axis to get a radius of gyration then about that kind of z-axis, if you would. In other, in other words, a resistance to torsion. All right, so this is ba the basics that what's going on when you get into an inventor and you set up your, or any other of these models, and you set up your boundary conditions. So let's take a look at that to finish out the last 20 minutes and tell those who didn't make it to class or those that did that there's come days you don't want to miss, and I guess yesterday, but I hope things, you all had good reasons for it, and I'm sure you did. So, and you'll maybe share those with me if you're missing two, three, four, five classes in a row. And right now, I'm going to go back to review here and talk about well, how this might work in Inventor. Well, in Inventor, one thing we might have is we might have that put into an assembly, right? We might have that in assembly here. We might have a couple pieces put together, and we might then have something here connect it up and we might have used a fixed mount. Now there's a way to you know um, actually do a pin joint, fixed joint and you might have basically some boundary conditions here and here. You might have something that's kind of linking this. So this idea of a, the idea of loads and then degrees of freedom at different points in your structure is going to be kind of key as we get into discussion of how modeling systems work. Now, what you'll see here, and I'll finish this out, in addition to understanding that the allowable stress equation says that the maximum or the stress should be less than or equal to generally somewhere around 16% of the yield stress, that is, in fact, for bending. And for uh, axial stress, this number is around 60% or it goes down. However, if you are looking at a column, right, which generally the calculation of the stresses inside is pretty easy, if that's a force P and it has this has a cross-sectional area of A sub 0 equals A right then you know that the stress is P over A however the allowable stress this number changes a lot and it's going to be based on a number of things the unbraced length it's going to be based on the um, how constrained these are on the ends so you're going to see a number of things come up when we get into deal with columns all right hang on here all right, so that general sense that this equation here is going to change, that number is going to change based on some conditions on your column. And even in the end when we start talking about uh, the concept of beams or joists or bending members, I'll go here one more time and do new. Even when we're talking then about members that are subject to some load, All right? There's our load here. It is supported by a pin joint and a roller joint. Perhaps since it's supported by a load, right? W, right? And this is L, therefore you have our end support W, L over two, W, L over two, and in fact, what you're going to see that that what occurs here at any one point, if we cut the beam, cut the beam, we end up having this condition, right? You've got W L over two, and then this here becomes W L over two, and this is then L over four, and so you have in effect a bending moment there. So in other words, this has a bending moment of L over 2, and this is a bending moment of L over 4. And so you basically have a maximum bending moment of WL squared over 8. All right, that's going to, you're going to see a lot of these equations start jumping back at you, and that's because the, generally the way this stuff works. So this moment arm's got, it's the same force back and forth here, the shear. If you know, have you have double L over two up here and W L over two down here, the shear works out to be even, and so you end up this standard shear diagram looks like this. Sorry, basically like this, 
and the bending diagram looks like this with the maximum bending being WL squared over 8. And so you'll see a lot of these equations come at you. The first time they're going to come at you is when we look at the quintessential cable. And I did it wrong in class today in one of my side classes, but basically you're going to see that the sag, the tension is equal to WL squared over 8 times the sag or something like that. All right, thanks for listening. That's 20 minutes. We'll call it good. Hopefully you can pull out the equations from this or come to class.